Hey, how's it going? I'm going to explore the Fibonacci sequence using a programming language called Python and at the same time illustrate some programming techniques. This video assumes you know a little bit about computer programming. I encourage you to type the same commands and explore on your own in Python. If you're using a Mac, open up your Applications folder and then the Utilities folder and start the terminal. Once you've started the terminal window, you can start Python just by typing in Python and hitting Enter. If you have Windows, you have to install Python. You can do that from sigwin.com or activestate.com. Once you've installed it, just type in Python at the command prompt, and everything I'm going to show you is going to be the same for both operating systems after that. Okay, let's remember what the Fibonacci sequence actually is. It starts off 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Uh, each number is the sum of the previous two numbers, and I've just defined a list in Python with the first few values. But what's really interesting with a programming language is that we can define a function that will always calculate the right value of f of n. So in this case, n is going to be the index of the Fibonacci number. So for example, if I say n equals 3, then I'm talking about 2 because 2 is the third Fibonacci number in that list. Um, so what I've just done is I've defined a function so that the first two values are the same as n, which works out because if I start with 0 and 1 and I continue by adding the previous two values, I, I still get the whole Fibonacci sequence. And so you can see I'm just testing out some values here and I get the Fibonacci sequence. Let's say I want to figure out what the first, say, 20 Fibonacci numbers are. I can use a Python uh, keyword called range, and if I put a number after a range, then it gives me a list of the first, in this case, 10 numbers, starting from 0. So the last one's always going to be n minus 1, where n is the range. So if I put in range 20, I get 0 through 19. Now I can use another Python function called map, and the way map works is it'll apply our function f, to anything in the list that comes after it. So in this case, I've just figured out the first 20 Fibonacci numbers, starting from, remember, n equals 0. Um, just to show you another example, let's say I put in a list 3, 10, and 15. Then I know that the third Fibonacci number is 2, the 10th one is 55, and the 15th is 610. Let's compute f for some higher values of n. The 20th Fibonacci number is 6,765. Here's the 25th and the 30th. Now something you might notice here is actually it takes a few seconds for Python to figure out what the 33rd Fibonacci number is. This is kind of curious because if you have pencil and paper you could figure this out by hand pretty quickly. So why is the computer taking so long? Well the way we define the function f it's actually a little inefficient in that it recursively calls the function f many times. In other words, when I compute f of 33, it's not just calling f once, it's actually calling f of 31 and f of 32, and those call other functions also. So I'm going to introduce a global variable, not usually a good idea, but for fast programming it's helpful. So what I've done is I've redefined f, and now what I can do is I can call, let's say, f of 25, and we can see how many times recursively f was called. It looks like over 200,000 times. Okay, now I'm going to write a helper function so that I can more easily figure out how many times f gets called for other values of n. Okay, let's call this timed f. And what I'm going to do in this function is basically just set the variable time called back down to zero. Calculate the value by calling f, and then print out how many times we've called the function. And return the answer. So let's see if it worked. Just to test, we'll use n equals 25 again. Okay, good. The answer is the 25th Fibonacci number is 75,025, and it called it over 242,000 times. Uh, let's just try some smaller values. Okay, for 0, it called 
f only one time, which makes a lot of sense because we sort of hard-coded those values in. For n equals 2, it called it three times, which makes sense because the initial call plus two recursive calls. But we can see that very quickly the number of calls to f increases. So already for n equals 15, it called f 15 times. So what's going on? In order to help show why f is getting called so many times, I'm going to draw what's called a call graph for the function f. Let's say we want to compute the value for f of 3. What's happening internally is it's going to recursively call f of 1 and f of 2 in order to add those values up to find the final value. When it calls f of 1, it just returns the value 1 because n is less than 2, if you remember the function definition. For f of 2, it recursively calls f of 0 and f of 1. Those are base cases, so it stops for each of those. And in total, we make 5 calls to f to compute for n equals 3. Okay, let's see what happens when we call f of 4. It recursively calls f of 2 and f of 3, and it's going to remake all five calls that it made the last time, because it doesn't remember that it made those calls previously. We didn't program it to remember that. So it redoes all that work, and for f of 2, it still calls f of 0 and f of 1 again. So the total number of calls here is going to turn out to be 9 calls, and if we call f of 5, it'll redo this entire tree again. And you can kind of see how, as n goes up, the number of calls goes up very quickly. We can fix this inefficient algorithm by using a computer programming technique called memoization. The main idea of memoization is basically just to memorize the values of f of n for previous values of n. So for example, if someone called f of 5, we would compute that value and then store it so that later when someone called, say, f of 6, we would very easily be able to remember the value of f of 5 instead of having to recalculate it. I'm going to re-implement the function f with a new variable called known values. I'll use that for the memoization. I'm still going to keep track of how many times this function gets called, but now what I'm going to do is first I'm going to say, okay, if we've already memorized that value, then I can just return the memorized value. Otherwise, I can compute it, the new value, but I still have to add an extra line for memorizing the value. So when I say known values of n is equal to the new value, that's the memorization part, and we'll return the computed value. Okay, let's check out what happened. Uh, if I say time def for zero, okay, it still calls it one time, that's good. Let's try it for value five. Okay, called it nine times as we predicted. Now I'm gonna call it a second time. This time it only called f one time because we memorized the value. Let's try 33. Remember that took a long time before. Well here it only called f 57 times, much less than the last value, and we still get the correct number for the 33rd. Fibonacci number. Uh, let's check what the hundredth Fibonacci number is. It's a pretty big number and it computed it very 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 quickly. Here's the thousandth value. Something cool about Python is that it can work with very large integers like this easily. Other programming languages often have to use a library or special tools in order to deal with that. Now I encourage you to start with the tools we've seen in this video and use Python and explore the Fibonacci sequence on your own. One unsolved problem is how many prime numbers there are in the Fibonacci sequence. Maybe you could explore this unsolved question with a program. Other ideas include looking for different patterns or checking known patterns in the Fibonacci sequence or even playing with different sequences. What happens if you start with, say, 3, negative 1 instead of 1, 1 or use a different recursive rule to define your sequence? Try it out.